This meeting of the MTSU Board of Trust is coming call to order. As a, as a tradition of this board, we're going to ask retired Lieutenant General Keith Hubert to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. General, while you have the floor, would you please honor us with another tradition that I hope will be here forever, and that you recognizing a veteran. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, beginning as a West Point cadet, I have served our nation in uniform in the United States Army for over four decades. As a result of that service, I have trained with, worked alongside, commanded, fought alongside, and fought against every military in the world with the exception of North Korea and China. I give you this context to talk about my personal opinion of why the armed forces of the United States of America are the best in the world. Some of you may have heard the saying that generals can't win wars, but they can sure lose them. I'm probably a living example of that fact. The reason our armed forces, in my opinion and my experience, are the best in the world is because of the non-commissioned officers. The veteran that I will present to you today is the standard that I always judge myself against. This is a sergeant major, the highest rank of a non-commissioned officer in the armed forces of the United States. You could call it the non-commissioned officers general. And much like you have officers that not only have a certain rank <coughs> designation, you have a duty description. And only the very best are privileged to be in command, to be ultimately responsible for every aspect of their soldiers' lives to include their life and death. And so not only will I present to you a sergeant major, I present to you command sergeant major, who enlisted in the Army in 1986 in the month of January, decided that the skill set that he wanted to have was that of saving people, of being a combat medic. Command sergeant major retired Doyle served for 30 plus years in the United States Army. His overseas tour include Germany on three separate occasions, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and most recently, Africa, where he worked on battling the trauma and the deadly impact of Ebola. He will graduate from Middle Tennessee State University this summer with a bachelor's of science degree in health management. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Command Sergeant Major Retired Manuel Doyle. I'd like to start by saying, uh, Dr. B, Lieutenant Hubner, thank you for this. Oftentimes, military service members, we hear the word, thank you for your service. I can tell you, thank you for your support. The vet center that I, I use the vet center daily. I'm on campus four times a week. I live in Lebanon, Tennessee. So that is my hub. Each day I'm here on this campus. I know students that come from Clarksville that are there, I eat lunch with them, and I know students that come from Alabama. Uh, state, of a, state of the art, world state facility. Uh, faculty is highly professional. 
Uh, I get a sense that they truly, genuinely care about each and every service member. And I, I appreciate the, the time here today. And again, thank you for what you're doing for the current, the past, and the future veterans that come to your campus. It's an outstanding facility, and uh, you earn my respect. Thank you. I'm Steve Smith. I'm your chairman and appreciative of this duty and honor. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome today to my fellow trustees, faculty, staff, student, administrators, and everybody that's taken the time to be in our audience. As we begin our meeting, I'd like to ask President McPhee if he'd like to make a few opening remarks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I will join the chairman in welcome all of you to our meeting and our special guests. I would like to just recognize uh, our liaison uh, with uh, the governor's office and with THEC, Ms. Lauren Collier, who's with us today. Lauren, thank you for your support and service to our university. And we have uh, um, a couple of our coaches here uh, that are part of uh, a program that we will be doing a little later. We have Coach Insel and Coach Stocksell. Um, and several of our student athletes that we formally introduce a bit later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Trustee Adams? Here. Trustee Baker? Here. Trustee DeLay? Here. Trustee Freeman? Here. Trustee Jacobs? Here. Trustee Johnston? Here. Trustee Karbawiak? Here. Trustee Smith? Here. Trustee Tracy? Here. Trustee Wright? Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. All present. Good. Thank you. First on our agenda is public comment. First matter before the board this afternoon is a request by Scott and Michelle Huddleston to address the board. The Huddleston submitted a timely request, and uh, we're happy to have them here today. We're going to allow five minutes for that request. Thank you, Huddlestons, for being here and the nearest podium is right there. I'm going to ask the secretary to keep a track and the floor is yours, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to address you today. Um, what I want to talk to the board about is I want to urge you to consider adopting, developing and adopting a professional coaching code of conduct. I'm sure you've all heard the news lately. Um, unfortunately, some of our sister schools, um, Georgia Tech, University of um, North Carolina and also Northern Kentucky have all suspended and fired such um, coaches for verbal, mental, and emotional abuse. It is a very widespread problem and it is a real concern. MTSU currently has uh, their policy 10 for faculty, which just is very generic and just does not go deep enough for the situations that come up in, in coaching and athletics. Um, when you say you, do, you, know, you have to treat somebody with respect and dignity, that's very easy to understand in an in a educational situation. A uh, professor doesn't call out a student who's done poorly on a test and kick them out of the test because they haven't worked hard enough or ask them to turn their MTSU shirt inside out because they don't deserve to wear the logo. But those things under a coaching context by some are considered acceptable. And without any guidelines, the student athletes just really kind of have to accept whatever they're dealt because there's nothing saying that they can't be treated that way. So I really think that for the best interest of the school and for the student athletes, it would be great if you guys could write some policy that's very specific to coaching that sets standards that are enforceable and accountable and that have means for reporting and observation and all of those things that come in with that sort of thing. Because a lot of these things happen behind the scenes and they're not in the public eye. And another thing I would really like MTSU to consider is adopting or implementing some of the NCAA best practices for mental health. Currently, MTSU has no services that are specifically for mental health for the student athletes. 
there is not a third person that's not involved with the athletic program that they can go to to discuss any kind of problems they're having. And not only negative problems, just, just all of the stuff that they have to deal with as far as being an athlete and being a student. And I really feel like having some mental health services could be beneficial for the coaches also because they can observe things. Maybe they can help the coaches to better reach a student to be able to reach their full potential if they're struggling with you know, performance anxiety and things like that. But I really feel that the students need somebody that's not associated with the athletic department that they feel confident that they could go to when they need, when they need help um, because currently there's nothing there for them in those situations. So that's really what I'd like to see MTSU consider is adopting a coach of conduct for coaches specifically and that would reach also the whole athletic programs. And I think it would benefit everybody. It's a positive thing for, for everybody and uh, I really feel like it needs to be done. And also the mental health issues really need to be addressed. I thank you for you taking your time to, to visit with us today. And I'd like to ask staff to take the appropriate uh, time to, to review her suggestions. Now's the time. Has anybody look at the, looked at the minutes? And are, I have. So. We have a motion to approve the minutes by Vice Chairman Freeman. I Do I have a second? Second. Voice vote on this. All in favor say aye. 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 Nay. Any? Thanks. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. On page 13, I'd just like to have a follow-up note. Did we declare a, any dip, uh, appreciation to the Governor Haslam as follow-up of the request? Not as yet, sir. But that is an item that's going to be taken care of. It will be taken care of. Thank you. That should be noted in discussion uh, right before our vote, please. I kind of got ahead of us. Is that okay? Or after the vote, it doesn't make any difference. Our next item on the agenda is a report of actions taken by the Academic Affairs Student Life and Athletics. We're lucky to have Chairman Pam Wright. Go. Okay, thank you, Chairman Smith. Move a little closer here. The Academic Affairs, Student Life, and Athletics Committee met on March 18, 2019. Our meeting began with approval of the minutes from November 13, 2018. The next action items concern the promulgation of two proposed rules and revisions to corresponding policies. The first proposed rule and policy revisions concern academic misconduct. Revisions to policy 312 clarify the role of academic, director of academic integrity, established a revised process for faculty to refer students accused of academic misconduct, discuss possible sanctions for repeat offenders, and establish a procedure for adjudicating academic misconduct for graduate students. TCA Code 49-8-203A1D requires the promulgation of rules regarding student conduct, which would include academic misconduct. The content of the proposed rule is consistent with the revised policy. The second proposed rule and policy revisions concern residency reclassification. TCA Code 49-8-104 requires the Board of Trustees to promulgate a rule defining residence of, residency of students to be used for the purpose of determining whether or not out-of-state tuition shall be charged to a student enrolling at MTSU. The proposed rule incorporates the criteria of 49-8-104 as well as additional criteria to define residency. The policy was recently reviewed by the Divi Division of Student Affairs, revealing a number of updates needed to reflect current policies and changes to state laws. These changes align our policy with current state and federal laws. The most significant changes to the policy relate to our student veterans and the benefits they receive requiring us to classify them, 
many of them as in-state for tuition and fee paying purposes. Other minor clarifications of existing criteria were made and the title of the policy was condensed. The committee approved both of these items. <coughs> Several action items regarding academic programs were presented by Provost Mark Burns. The committee approved academic program modifications to evaluate the Masters of Education and Professional Counseling to specialist in education and professional counseling, and to change the Master of Sciences in Public Health to Masters of Public Health. Also approved were academic degree programs under consideration, which included Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology, Master of Science in Biomedical Sciences, and Master of Public Health. We were also informed of two other academic actions, the consolidation of the MST in mathematics and the MS in mathematics, and termination of postmaster certificate in family nurse practitioner. So Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, materials uh, for these were available to you in your notebooks and prior to the meeting, and that concludes my report. Th thank you, Chairman Wright. A lot of discussion and really fruitful um, actions and discussions were taken at her committee. And now's the time that we need to memorialize those. And Heidi, I'll ask for you to correct me when uh, we need to ha have three or four separate actions. We need a roll call vote for each of the rules and policies and then a third vote on the remaining items. And the third vote will just be a voice vote. Uh, Madam Secretary, might I ask if everybody has reviewed these, if there's any discussion on, we'll just ask for discussion on any of the items being proposed. Heidi knows where I'm going. I didn't get a good look, but can we take these at one time? Yes, sir. You, we actually do need a separate vote on, on each of the uh, rules. So. Um, academic misconduct, and then residency classification needs a So how do I, how I identify? I'll make a motion on the academic uh, misconduct rule. Second. 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 So we have a motion made on what's titled academic misconduct, and we have a second. Would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Trustee Adams? Yes. Trustee Baker? Yes. Trustee DeLay? Yes. Trustee Freeman? Yes. Trustee Jacobs? Yes. Trustee Johnston? Yes. Trustee Kabawayak? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Wright? Yes. Unanimous. I'll make a motion on the residency uh, reclassification. Second. Any discussion? Would you please call the roll? Trustee Adams? Yes. Trustee Baker? Yes. Trustee DeLay? Yes. Trustee Freeman? Yes. Trustee Jacobs? Yes. Trustee Johnston? Yes. Trustee Carbawia? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Wright? Yes. Again, uh, nine ayes. And I'll make a motion of uh, approval on the residency classification. Second. It, motion made and seconded. Discussion, comments, questions? Madam Secretary? Uh, perhaps I was. Uh, I'm sorry. Was we that. just took a vote on that. Correct? Oh, did we? Okay, right. sorry about that. So, um, Which is the next one we should be considering. We just need a voice vote then on the remaining items uh, from that committee report. If everybody's reviewed the remaining items, I'd like to entertain a... So moved. We have it moved. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Motion's been made and second. Voice vote's okay here? Yes, sir. All in favor say aye. 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 Noes? Aye. Sounds unanimous from the chair. Our next report is from the Audit and Compliance Committee. Chris Korboiak is our chairman. Trustee Korboiak, chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Audit and Compliance Committee met this morning, April 3rd, 2019, and two univer university policy revisions were presented. Uh, first, Policy 10, Ethics and Code of Conduct. The proposed revisions to Policy 10 provides for the addition of an annual mandatory ethics training for all employees, including student workers, where appropriate. In addition, 
a new section entitled Healthy Workplace was added to comply with the Healthy Workplace Act, TCA Section 50-1-50, which includes information about abusive conduct in the workplace. Greater clarity concerning reporting procedures for ethics violations outside of abusive conduct, which is handled by human resources, also is included in the policy as part of the revisions. Finally, inappropriate use or misuse of computer or information technology resources in violation of institutional policy was added to the section entitled Appropriate Use of University Resources, and more detailed information was included regarding the enforcement of this policy. And Policy 12, Conflict of Interest. The proposed revisions to Policy 12 include the following. One, a change in the responsible office and officer of the policy from the Office of the University Council to the Office of Compliance and Enterprise Risk Management. Two, greater clarity concerning the process for new employees to disclose conflicts of interest. Three, revisions to the conflict of interest checklist that faculty are required to utilize for any of their authored works used in class. And four, greater clarity and specificity regarding the process for conflicts of interest that primarily involve externally funded research, which will be referred to the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs and or the Division of Academic Affairs for review pursuant to Policy 404, Conflict of Interest for Externally Funded Projects. The committee approved revisions to both policies. Several informational items were also presented at our meeting, which included a report of conflict of interest disclosures for 2018, a review of the President's Statement of Disclosures of Interest for 2019, report on compliance with public records policy, and the results of external reviews, which were controller, Comptroller of the Treasury Audit Report for Fiscal Year 2018 and the NCAA Agreed Upon Procedures for Fiscal Year 2018. And a quarterly report, results of internal audit reports, was also presented. The public meeting of the committee adjourned and the committee went into executive session to discuss audits and investigations. Mr. Chairman and trustees, materials outlining these actions were made available for your review prior to this meeting and are also contained in your board books. Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, that concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Is, are there any questions, uh, Chris? Then we need a motion. So moved. Second. Any more questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Does it need a roll call on that? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Ayes win. It's unanimous. Next item on our agenda is a report of the Executive and Governance Committee. I'd like to ask Vice Chairman Freeman to provide us with a summary of our work. Thank you, Chairman Smith. The Executive and Governance Committee met on March 18th, 2019. Minutes from the committee meetings held on November 13th, 2018 and November 27th, 2018 were approved. The first action item was the consideration of the institutional mission statement and the mission profile. TCA 49-8-101D requires the institution to annually submit its institutional mission statement to THEC for review and approval. On February 22nd, 2019, the University Planning Committee reviewed the mission statement and mission profile. It approved one correction of fact to keep the mission profile current. It approved one, <clears throat> the mission statement and mission profile were then reviewed and approved by the president. The mission statement and mission profile were approved by the committee. Once approved by the board at its, April at its April meeting, the mission statement and mission profile will be provided to THEC to fulfill this statutory requirement. The next item before the committee, committee was the establishment of expense, limit, expense limits for the spouse of the university president. At its December 11th, 2018 meeting, the board of trustees approved the president's employment agreement. Provision 6.F of that agreement states, the board recognizes that the spouse of the university president is often called upon to devote substantial time and energy to activities which benefit the university. 
and she does an outstanding job doing that, Dr. McPhee. Dr. McPhee's spouse hereby, is hereby authorized to serve when called upon as a representative of the institution and to accept reimbursement from the university or foundation for expenses incurred in connection with such activity. To the extent such reimbursements are requested by Dr. McPhee and must be approved for payment by the Vice President for Business and Finance, the Foundation, or the Chair of the Audit and Compliance Committee in writing and in advance of any reimbursement, and approved exceptions shall be reported by the Vice President for Business and Finance to the Audit and Compliance Committee at its next meeting. It is understood that Dr. McPhee's spouse may use facilities and other resources of the university in the same manner as an employee when involved in such activities. The institution shall also assume the travel expenses of Dr. McPhee's spouse on business trips to which she is officially invited or for which her presence is regarded by Dr. McPhee as necessary to carry out his presidential duties to promote a favorable image of the institution. Dr. McPhee will be responsible for any tax consequences resulting from benefits provided to Dr. McPhee's spouse pursuant to Section F. The Board of Trustees shall annually establish a reasonable cap on expenses allowed by this paragraph F. From time to time, the Board Chair may increase the cap based on need. An annual accounting of expenses will be provided to the Audit and Compliance Committee. Specifically, the provision provides the Board of Trustees shall annually establish a reasonable cap on expenses allowed by this paragraph F. Based on an analysis of the past three years, expenses for Dr. McPhee's spouse is included in the annual audit of the Office of the President. A $5,000 annual cap would appear very reasonable. The committee recommends an annual cap in the amount of $5,000. The chairman and trustees materials outlining these actions were made available for Mr. Chairman and trustees materials outlining these actions were made available for your review <coughs> prior to this meeting and are contained in your board notebooks. Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, that concludes my report. Thank you, Vice Chairman Freeman. Do I have a motion to approve the actions of the Executive and Gov Committee. So moved. Second. Motion been made and second. Any discussion, questions, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Unanimous. Do we need a voice vote? A voice vote's great. That's what we did. Thank you, Heidi. Our next agenda item is the approval and actions of Finance and Personnel Committee. I'd like to ask Chairman Jacobs to provide us with a summary of his work. Thank you, Chairman Smith. And the Finance and Personnel Committee met on March 18, 2019. First item on the agenda was the approval of the minutes from the November 13, 2018 Finance and Personnel Committee meeting. The next item of business was consideration of a proposed rule and revisions to policy concerning traffic parking and safety enforcement. Their current policy does not identify a specific duration for the award of a temporary disabled permit. The, only, the policy only states that such permits will be issued for injuries or disabilities or limited duration as specified by a position statement certifying an impairment. The request is being made to revise policy 775, which will set the issuance duration to a period not to exceed one semester or four consecutive months, whichever is of greatest benefit to the individual requesting the permit. This revision, revision will allow the university to be consistent with current per semester permits and will eliminate the potential for oversight error by requiring matters concerning temporary disabled permits to be resolved by the conclusion of the current or upcoming term. The corresponding provision in the proposed rule will be consistent with this provision of policy. The committee approved this action item. Next was a request for a building name change. The faculty in the School of Agribusiness and Agri-Science met on February 21st, 2018 and voted to change the name of the department to the School of Agriculture. 
That was the name of the department prior to the name change in the late 1990s. This change was approved and became effective July 1, 2018. In alignment with the department name change, a request was made in October 2018 to change the name of the Stark Agribusiness and Agri-Science Center back to the Stark Agriculture Center, which was the name given to the building when it was erected in 1978. As required by MTSU Policy 160, the request was submitted to the Building Name Advisory Committee for a consideration and recommendation, and they concurred. The Finance and Personnel Committee approved the recommendation for the building name change. The last item on the agenda was the approval of the MTSU Foundation Agreement. Upon recommendation, this item was deferred and a request was made for University Advancement Vice President Joe Bales to provide an overview of relationship between the Foundation and the University. That pre presentation occurred just prior to this board meeting. Mr. Chairman and fellow trustees, materials outlining these actions were made available for review prior to this meeting are included in the board notebooks. That concludes my report. Thank you, Chairman Jacobs. We need a motion to so approve the so move. Promulgation of rule and revisions of policy, traffic, parking, safety. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a second. How does this... It, Give it us does, a roll sir. call. This is a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Adams? Yes. Trustee Baker? Yes. Trustee DeLay? Yes. Trustee Freeman? Yes. Trustee Jacobs? Yes. Tr Trustee Johnston? Yes. Trustee Kabawia? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Wright? Yes. Nine aye. Thank you. Next, we need a motion to approve the remaining items that were recommended by finance and personnel. So moved. Items have been moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Unanimous. Our next item is report from the board secretary. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, as you know, the, I have been delegated a limited authority to make minor revisions to policy and the information found on page 231 uh, show those changes that have been made since the last board meeting. Uh, primarily, they are changes to uh, titles, names of, of titles, or correcting uh, typos, that type of thing. I, I will point out that we have had a new policy uh, established in the meantime, policy 608, taxability of employee benefits, uh, and this is a president-approved policy. It's not a policy that I, I put in place myself. It went through that process, but it seemed appropriate enough to add it to my report to bring this to your attention. You'd like for us to act on that as well? No, sir. So <coughs> this, is, this is simply informational. In your report. Thank you very much. Is there anything that needs to be um, voted on in your report? No, sir. Well, thank you. Well done. Now is the time for the president's report. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I appreciate, always appreciate this opportunity uh, to uh, present this report uh, to you. First, um, our recruitment and enrollment update. This afternoon, um, I would like to first compliment our faculty, staff, and our administrators, uh, particularly in student affairs, for the tremendous work they have done uh, for the recruitment for the fall of 2019 class. Some very impressive numbers uh, at this point that I will, I will present to you. Um, first, new freshmen. As of April 1st, our freshman applications are up 12%. As of April 1st, our freshman admits are up by 16.8%. We anticipate that our August numbers of new freshmen enroll will be up about 10% over fall of 2018. We believe these freshman numbers are being driven up by a significant increase in the amount of guaranteed freshman scholarship at the presidential level. We will look towards staying on trend, increasing these numbers for fall of 2020 
by also adding the amount of guaranteed freshman scholarship at the trustee level for 2020. I also want to give you an update on our recruitment and admission of transfer students. As you know, for the last five, six, seven, eight years, we've been the number one destination for transfer student in the entire state. As of April 1, our transfer applications are up 9.4%. As of April 1st, our transfer admits are up by 12%. I want to remind uh, members of the board, Mr. Chairman, and our guests that the university has a very strict, high guaranteed admissions requirement. We only admit about 69 to 70% of all the applicants. And I'm told by our vice president that as of uh, today, we have 10,870 plus applications for 2019. And we, are, we still have about six or seven months uh, to go uh, as part of the application process. So we are very comfortable that uh, we'll top the 11,000, which would be a record number for the university. We believe that the increase um, of our transfer student is being driven by our ongoing presence of transfer recruits and recruiters. We have on site our major feeder community colleges. We are very, very active in some of the community colleges. We actually have an office space where we have our recruiters, our advisors. Every summer, I make a personal trip to every single community college and visit with the president and talk about how we can improve our services, our support for our community students. And I think it's paying off with the great work uh, from admissions and uh, the recruiters in that area. We continue to strengthen these partnerships uh, through a very unique program that Student Affairs developed that the uh, community college presidents have been very, very positive about. It's called the MTSU Promise Transfer Agreement. And we have signed that with Motlow, Chattanooga, Columbia State, Southwest State, Cleveland State, and Dysburg. And the others we have on the list uh, of the community college to sign. So we're looking forward to uh, moving forward in this area, particularly as it relates to our transfer efforts. And just a note, I think you will find very interesting. You've heard a lot in the news recently about the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and their free tuition for families uh, 50,000 and below, uh, low income family. Now, when UT announced its loan debt stats, I asked our financial aid folks to check on our own. I would have expected um, and guessed that ours to be higher than the University of Tennessee Knoxville, primarily because the average family income, the differentiation there. However, what we found in looking at income levels and Pell eligibility, UTK is celebrating at a 46% of their student graduate with no debt at all. 46%. At MTSU, we can celebrate that 41% of our students do not take on any debt if MTSU is the only institution that they attend. We looked at those who are transferring from other institutions. As you know, student debt is a big issue and is being discussed nationally. And I think there's a lot of times when there isn't a differentiation between private school tuition and fees and the debt that students pay to go to private schools uh, or incur as opposed to our public institutions. And so this is really very important statistics. If our student transferred from somewhere else, as we know over 50% of our students are transfer students at university, 38% of those students graduate with zero debt. So again, the fact that we're looking at a disparity in median family income, and these results really shows um, uh, some significant progress in that area by university. Now on our legislative activity, 
I want to share with you a brief update on our legislative activity and involvement. We've been extremely busy this past uh, couple of months. On March 12th, we had a very successful MTS, MTSU day on the Hill. And we had trustees and staff members met with many of our local delegation, as well as some of the leaders in the legislative committees and chairs. On March 25th, we appeared, I prepared before the House Finance and Ways Committee to present our budget. Each year, every institution has to defend its budget, and that budget must be approved by these committees in order for the university to be funded for the new year. So it's a very serious um, activity that we, we participate in. On the 26th, we, we did that in front of the House Finance Ways and Means Committee. We did it along with THEC, TBR, and UT. They divided up the LGIs. We were the first groups. That afternoon, we came before the House Government Operations Committee, where a bill to sunset the law considering our Board of Trustees. Every two years, the legislature um, requires the board and the university to come before it uh, in order for it to be continued. And if that is not approved by that legislative committee, the board goes out of existence. And so that hearing um, was uh, held recently and on June 30th of 21, after the presentation, the committee voted uh, to pass our bill on to the House floor. And so you're in existence now until June 30th, 2021, and then we have to go back and do this all over again. On March 26, we were asked to present our budget to the House Higher Education Subcommittee, along with the University of Memphis and Tennessee State University. Our presentation uh, went uh, very well. Finally, on March 27th, uh, I thought perhaps I need to take residence up at the Legislative Plaza. Um, on March 27th, Chairman Smith and Vice Chairman uh, Darrell Freeman uh, joined us, joined me for our budget hearing before the Senate Education Committee. This meeting went exceptionally well. I think uh, trustees who are present will agree with that. Uh, and our budget was approved and will be considered by the full Senate uh, within a few weeks. I want to thank a number of our staff members who did a great deal of preparation um, for us appearing before the board uh, and the various committees. Sandra Wade from Legal Affairs, John Hood, Joe Bales, Alan Thomas, and Ms. Kim Edgar for the outstanding work in preparing me for those various hearings. <clears throat> and as of February 26, Chairman Smith and I spent an entire day, he wore me out, an entire day meeting various colleagues and legislators. And I'm gonna ask the Chairman to uh, give a brief update on our busy day on February 26. We earned our pay that day, or at least I earned my pay that day. Thank you. Which is zero. Um, I was about to say. Yeah, which is zero. In, a, in an effort to, of outreach, and, and frankly, the president had the best line, and then I stole it on the previous next meetings. But we met with the president of the University of Tennessee, Randy Boyd. We met with Dr. Fisher, who's the president of Belmont, and Dr. Lowry, who's the president of Lipscomb. And the president's line that was excellent, that is we have exchange programs all over the world, and we don't have one with Belmont, Lipscomb, and UT. And there has to be something that our students could use at their facilities or they could use at our facilities to encourage a public-private partnership, which I think is one of the things Governor Haslam envisioned when he seated us. Um, we've already heard back from two of those, and um, I'm hoping some fruit will, will, um, will be had. We have programs they don't have, they have programs we don't have. 
Randy Boyd had an excellent suggestion. Since we get so many transfers from UT, he wants to make sure that they're equipped to do well here, uh, which instead of just saying they're gone, on to what's next. So I think it'll be up to uh, you guys and the president to work it, but the door's been open with those institutions to try to uh, help, help other children. We also did kind of a political rally that day. President and I went to see Speaker Glenn Cassidy, uh, Lieutenant Governor McNally, and Governor Lee, and spent a, probably too long, it's been a long time with each. And like I say, there was no request. It was here we are and this is what we do. And um, I, I think there'll be fruits from, from that labor ongoing. And I was pleased to, uh, to participate in that. And the president did a heck of a good job that day and we're trying to move the ball forward. Just one more comment, it's not quite, but sure. the last time Trustee Adams asked, how do we judge if we're doing good? I mean, and the president and I have talked about this every time we've met, which is over a dozen in the last six months. And he sent us out a scorecard and he, he sent that as a suggestion. I mean, here's how, here's three or four metrics. But the challenge is, and I'll ask Kim to resend those, a windshield scorecard or whatever. And the challenge for us is, if you have additional ones, you don't think they're adequate, you think they're too much, it's time now for the trustees to weigh in, how do you think we should be measured? And um, obviously there's lots of good ones. I think what you provided to begin with is an excellent start and looking forward to, you know, having a scorecard, here's where we are with other LGIs. And how long does it take, how much money? I think debt, I think the one you just gave is an excellent one, Mr. President. That's percentage of people to graduate with debt. Um, so we've had a busy uh, quarter and I look forward to uh, a more busy quarter. Finish up, I'm sorry. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate those comments. Now today, I'm extremely pleased. Um, at the recommendation of our chairman, a few weeks ago when we met, um, we would like to recognize some of our outstanding students at, as this academic year comes to a close. And I really want to stress this point. Your university attracts some of the best students around the state and around the nation. We have one of the highest GPA and ACT scores. And you will see from this list of individuals that we're going to recognize, they represent the best of the best. So if anybody tells you anything else, they don't know what they're talking about and they should come and learn and get the facts. We're very proud of our students. We are very proud of the accomplishments of our students that go on to major universities or graduate school and very, very competitive at all levels. So first, and I'd ask the uh, students when I read your bio, if you can come forward and let us look at your handsome or beautiful face as we read um, your bio. And we have a number of the parents and family members that are here. And if you are a coach or a supporter of these uh, students, please come and join them as well. First is Kristen Cunningham. Let's give a round of applause, Kristen. <laughs> dean Vial from the dean, uh, Honors College. Dean is uh, accompanying her. And uh, just a little bio on Kristen. Uh, Kristen come, came to MTSU after two years of study at the University of Alaska, Anchorage, and several years of work in an insurance company. A single mother who has overcome a serious health issue, Kristen has earned a 4.0 GPA in chemistry and biology with a concentration in physiology and is graduating this spring. Last year, she was named very prestigious award, the National Goldwater Fellow Award, and she participated in a research experience for undergraduate at Scripps 
Research Center in La Jolla, California. She has received the MTSU University Provost Award, Dr. Burns Award, for Outstanding Non-Traditional Student, as well as the Outstanding Senior Award from the Biology Department and several Eureka and other Tribal Awards, Undergraduate Research Association Group. And she has presented research, ladies and gentlemen, at the American Society for Cell Biology. This is an undergraduate student. She received a first place among presentation from the College of Basic and Applied Sciences at the 2017 Scholars Day and is a member of Phi Kappa Phi. There's more, she's the author of articles in the Journal of Visualized Experiment and International Immunology Pharmacology. Did I get that right? Thank Immunopharmacology. You. Okay. <laughs> and abstracts. <laughs> in molecular biology of the cell. After being accepted into Scripps, she was accepted into Duke University. She was accepted into Princeton University. She has decided to attend the, attend the John Hopkins, Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, one of the premier medical school, not only in the nation, but really in, in, in the world. She will receive full funding to pursue a PhD either in biochemistry, cell or molecular biology, or cell and molecular medicine. Let us join in welcoming and congratulating. Woo, 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 woo. Very good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I might add that Dean Vile, as Dean of our Honors College, has done an incredible job. Um, we've had a uh, semi-finalist for Rhodes Scholar uh, out of our Honors College, and Kristen certainly represent uh, the best of the best. Now, Mr. Robert Owens. Robert? That's another Honors College student. Robert is an honors transfer fellow who came to MTSU after attending Full Sail University and after serving as a pastor for several years. Some of us need some blessings. <laughs> He's graduating with a degree in biology and is planning to go to medical school. He has already been accepted to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, again, a very top medical institution literally in the world. And he's on a waiting list at the Mayo Clinic of uh, School of Medicine, and he's awaiting an interview at New York University. Very prestigious institution. He has participated in a number of research projects and also has received the Undergraduate Research Award, grant, and scholarship to support his work. He's a recipient of the statewide Harold Love Award for Outstanding Community Service and is an active member of a number of campus groups, organizations, honor societies, and he's participate in mission trips and is MTSU nominee for the Phi Kappa Phi Scholarship. He and his wife, Ferris, <coughs> who is undergoing treatment for cancer, has three children. Let's give him a round of applause for his country.
Next, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we have a Murfreesboro native, incredible young lady, Alex Johnson. Alex, come on up. Let's give you a round of applause. Come on up, and the coach Ensign. I might add, I think Coach will tell you that uh, the. F uh, yeah, so he said she's taller than you, Coach. I didn't say that. <laughs> That's why we're recruited, Doctor. That's right. <laughs> I get it. And I'm going to brag on the First Lady. She was, and the Coach will tell you, that very active in recruiting Alex uh, to our university. She uh, was. Um, Alex, again, a Mur uh, native of Murfreesboro, recently completed one of the greatest individual careers of any blue lady raider in the program history. The Blackman High School graduate finished her career ranking in the top 10 of nine all-time categories at MTSU, including scoring, game started, field goal percentage, among others. Alex finished her career eighth on the Lady Raider all-time scoring list with 1,872 points. Wow. Alice, in my young day, I, I did 2,000, <laughs> but then I woke up. <laughs> Additionally, Alex is among the top 10 in five single season categories. Alex's outstanding play on the court has been recognized by coaches and media as evidenced by nine different all-conference honors including Conference USA Freshman of the Year, Conference USA Preseason Player of the Year, and three-time All-Conference USA Performer. Now, while she's been dominant, now really just on the court, just controlled, she's also excelled in the classroom. Alex is graduating with a degree in biochemistry and pre-pharmacy emphasis as an athlete. She has been named to the Conference USA Academic Honor Roll each of her collegiate career, each year. And Alex has excelled in the classroom and on the court. And you look at her, she does it with humility, class, and dignity. Alex, congratulations to you. And last but not least, we have our academic student athlete and an incredible athlete, Brent Stocksville. And Brent, would you come up and the uh, chairman would like to make uh, a few more Go ahead, comments. and that, when you finish, right before we give it, I have a couple. I'm a, I okay. mean, I can not be emotional. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Brent, and I think his dad, a former old coach and quarterback, is here, <laughs> our head coach. <laughs> I suppose to say young coach, Coach Stock. <laughs> now, Brand has enjoyed a stellar, and these are not exaggeration, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you really see what an incredible job these young people are doing uh, at our university. He had a stellar collegiate career, both in the classroom and on the football field during his time with the Blue Raiders. The Murfreesboro native was a three-time Conference USA all-academic team member. Earned in 2017, he earned a CUSA Scholar Athlete of the Year Award, was one of just three players nationally last year who entered the season with a master's degree already in hand. It was my pleasure to uh, give you that, uh, Brent, and was a semi-finalist for the prestigious 
William V. Campbell Trophy, a national uh, competition. This award is given to the college football player with the best combination of academics, community service, and on the field performance. It is actually considered to many to be the academic Heisman. On the field, football field, the three-year permanent team captain and the 2018 Conference USA MVP ended his career at Middle Tennessee with record holding in passing yards, touchdown passes, 300-yard passing games, 400-yard passing games, passing games per game, and completion and attempts. He also finished in the top 10 all-conference USA history, in the history of Conference USA, in touchdown passes, completions, attempts, passing yards, completion percentage, and 300-yard passing games. Brent was an exceptional, also exceptional in the community service, and he earned numerous honors for his efforts, including being named member of the AFCA All-State Good Works team, where he was honored on the field at the 2018 College Football Playoff semifinals in New Orleans. Incredible. Brent Stockstill, congratulations. I wanted to add a, a couple of things on a personal note. One, I'm still mad at his father because he's an excellent left-handed pitcher. And uh, his freshman year, when he didn't play football, he was a huge addition to, to the baseball team. But what I want to add is he's the hardest working Blue Raider there's ever been. When you look at Brent Stockstill, there's no Blue Raider that's ever outworked him. The best. If you look at the best quarterback in our history, and more than just touchdown, he's outworked everybody. I'm proud to be with you. Oh. Come on here, Coach. Before we let you know right there, you back. Okay, now, Mr. Chairman and trustees, uh, as this Semester comes to an end, it is time for us for a few changes in our trustee membership. Today will be the last meeting that Peyton Tracy will be participating in as Manifest. in his role as student trustee. We appreciate the insight Peyton has brought to the, this board and we wish him all the best we're in the process now of currently reviewing applicants for a new student trustee, and we'll be introducing that individual to the board at its next meeting in June. So let's give him a round of applause for his service. Finally. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, today is also the final meeting with our inaugural faculty trustee member, Professor Tony Johnston. Tony, as you have served as an outstanding representative of your peers, we appreciate your engagement with the board, 
your insight, and we wish you all the best in the years to come as an outstanding faculty member making good wine. <laughs> Fermentation <laughs> sciences. You. So, please, would you come and... Uh, <laughs> Trustees, you may uh, recall that the Faculty Senate developed a process in which they select the faculty trustee. The Senate recently completed their process, and today I would like to introduce to you our new faculty trustee, Dr. Mary Martin. Dr. Martin, would you come up and stand, please? Dr. Martin is a professor in our Department of Mathematical Sciences. She earned her bachelor's degree of science in mathematics at MTSU, <coughs> and she studied cumulative rain theory and earned her master's and PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's in her 20th year at MTSU, and she has taught undergraduate and graduate courses. She's managed multiple federal grants to benefit Tennessee middle and high school teachers. And I had the pleasure of serving with her as the faculty senate president during the year of the transition to the new board. And she brings a strong dedication to our students and a broad faculty perspective with her as she assumes the role of the second faculty trustee to this board. Congratulations, Dr. Martin, and on behalf of the board, we welcome you. Finally, members of the board, as I mentioned earlier, um, commencement is right around the corner. And on Friday, May 3rd at 3 p.m., uh, we'll have a commencement ceremony for the College of Graduate Studies. And at that time, 400 students will receive either their master's education, specialist, or doctoral degree. The guest speaker for our Friday ceremony is Dr. Judith Arietta Gross. She's a, a chemistry professor. She's director of the Women's STEM Center at MTSU. She's the recipient of the MTSU Foundation 2018 Career Achievement Award. And she will be our speaker on Saturday. Because of the size of our graduating class, we actually have three graduation ceremonies in May one in August and two in December. So on Saturday, May 4th, we'll have more than 2,100 2, students will receive their bachelor's degree. And I'm pleased to announce that our morning speaker will be our own trustee, Chris Kaboyak. I will be. And our afternoon speaker, will be the Honorable Governor Bill Lee. Please, trustee members, let Kim Edgar know if you will be attending so we can make the necessary arrangement. But I think we have an A1, top of the line, lineup for graduation in May. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. President, Vice President, Vice Chairman Freeman, what, do you have remarks? Yeah, I just have a few remarks, and I want to thank President McPhee for sending out that dashboard of information. I just wanted to share with the board just a couple of those points. Um, 
Our degrees per FTE continues to climb, Dr. McPhee. Thank you for the work in your team is doing there. Our graduation rate continues to climb. Our average ACT scores continue to climb. We confer over 4,000 degrees per year. That's major in this uh, area. And a large number of our students are receiving Pell Grants, of which I would have received, I've received one several years ago. So there's a lot of matrix to look at. I think these are some of the good ones and I wanna applaud the staff for all the work that you all are doing at this university to change the lives of the young people that come <coughs> to these halls every day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to thank everyone that helps put the, this meeting on. I know it's, there's a lot of, a lot of unsung heroes that prepare these notes and prepare these agendas in this room, and I'm appreciative. And again, I'm appreciative of being your chairman and look, look forward to a great year. And unless there's anything, other comments, our meeting is adjourned.